Hi booktube and welcome to my Friday Reads video which is informed by uh, this June being uh, Reading Women's Month. Uh, I read two novels, uh, Frankenstein by Jeanette Winterson, her latest book which uh, is on the bingo card that I'll show at the end is my uh, LGBTQ uh, book. Originally I was going to read an Anne Holmes novel called uh, uh, I can't even remember what it's called, uh, because A.M. Holmes is, uh, identifies as a lesbian, uh, as does Jeanette Winterson, but the, the, the reason I switched to this book is because there is a trans character at the heart of it. And the other book I read was The Lost Children Archive by Valeria Luiselli, uh, long listed for the Women's Prize, and this is The Road Trip, uh, Bingo Square. I'm going to start with Jeanette Winterson. Actually, before... Before I do that, I'm very grateful to the, uh, the Women's Read Along uh, because it's been a funny sort of year for, for reading for me in that I've read nearly 60 books which uh, at that rate I'd get about 120 by the year end which is more than I read last year but I haven't really been blown away as I was last year. Last year there were so many books that just you know were sort of incredible reading experiences for all sorts of different reasons and I haven't really experienced that much this year. It just seemed to be, I mean there are plenty of good books I've read they just seem to lack a bit of spark but then along comes this is my best reading week of the year so far because of these two books I mean I've read virtually everything Jeanette Winston's done big fan uh, so I was always going to like this uh, and Louis Silly this is the second book I've read and this could very well end up being my book of the year but you know spoiler alert I'm going to start with Winston because I, I did read this first so there's lots of elements to this book that you've read elsewhere before so there's the stuff about cryogenics where Don DeLillo covers in his Zero K book novel. Uh, there's stuff about sort of sex robots and sort of uh, automated uh, sex dolls which are brilliantly done uh, throughout Snuff by um, Victor Pelevin. Uh, I've got a video on that, uh, I'll post a link uh, to it. Um, and there's uh, one of the story lines is the 1815 uh, night in a in a uh, mansion in Geneva on Lake Geneva where Percy Shelley and his wife Mary Shelley nay Wollstonecraft um, and Lord Byron and Claire I can't remember her surname who is um, Mary Shelley's stepsister and Byron's personal physician Polidori they're all this is a true event they're all sort of you know uh, in the, in the house they're sort of stuck there because there's a terrible storm electrical storm raging outside and Polidori challenges them all to come up with a sort of supernatural story and out of that night came Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and that is such um, uh, a sort of a paradigmatic uh, historical event you know all these great minds together all these great radical thinkers and rebels together and out of that came you know Frankenstein which was a sort of a revolutionary book and it was written by a woman and it was dismissed at the time as you know women can't write particularly supernatural but you know and it's and of course Frankenstein is such a a, a book sort of you know redolent seething in sort of you know imagery and metaphor for for her times but also for the future um so I've seen, you know, I'm sure we've all read that in lots of other authors, uh, you know, fiction and non-fiction. So in a way, it's a bit of a tired trope. But this is Jeanette Winterson and she pulls it off. You know, all these sort of, as I say, slightly careworn themes. Uh, she brings her own magic to it to make it work, to knit it all together. Now, having said that, this is not the usual lyrical Jeanette Winterson uh, mellifluous prose it's much more it's a book of ideas rather than a book of sort of poetic language um, and I suspect that she is that's the direction that she's moving in um, but I, you know she's such a good writer that you know she she does it brilliantly in this so and I'll tell you sort of what the book's about before I give some examples so you have this um, her treatment of that famous night in uh, Lake Geneva and as I say in a way for me that's the weakness of the book because it, it doesn't really tell you anything new the best bit about it is the love between Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley as Winston describes it 
and imagines it because what Winston is supreme at is writing about love and relationships in, in all her books. And that's really strong in here. The historical, the, the, the uh, relaying of historical fact and some of the creative decisions behind Frankenstein were less fresh, I felt. And then in the modern day, we've got a character called um, uh, Rye Shelley. And Rye, R-Y, is not uh, for short for Ryan. It's the end of Mary, because Rye Shelley was born female and has had some um, surgical uh, operations whereby the top half of her body has been made male, but she hasn't touched the lower half of her body. And she is a doctor, medical doctor, and uh, she is having a relationship with a guy called um, Victor um, Stein, who is a professor and is absolutely obsessed with uh, the future of humankind in terms of cheating death or at least prolonging life very very far into the future so that death is not you know you don't die between the ages of 60 and, and 90 as it currently is but it's it's prolonged beyond that and one of the interesting thing is you know one of the, his attractions to uh rye shelley is because she has or he has uh, amended his body um, uh, through surgery and that's very much informing uh, you know the, the um, Stein's um, sort of research into cheating death because to cheat death you have to you have to alter the current biological body in some way so either you go down the robotics route or the cryogenics route or um, implants or a sort of part cyborg you know, all these sorts of things that, you know, form the bedrock of the transhumanist uh, movement. And, and that is Winterson's concern in here, in that she is making a, drawing a direct uh, heritage between Mary Shelley's invention of Frankenstein, who are a monster, who after all was sewn together from bits of other human beings and then galvanised by electricity into animating its spirit. Um, and Winterson is comparing that to where we are now, the sort of transhumanist drive for, you know, for prolonging life or, or, or changing human form to prolong life. And also, of course, in, in you know, the, the sort of self-administered or the, at least the decision taken in, you know, to have surgical surgery to change your body uh, assignment. Um, that, that is that is the core of the meat of this book. Um, and there's lots of interesting ideas. I mean, I've read a lot of non-fiction this year about transhumanism and stuff because it fits in with something that I'm writing. I'm not quite sure what conclusions we're supposed to draw from this book. I mean, it's good that it's not sort of an instrumental book in that Winston is telling you what to think or what your attitude should be towards, you know, these drives to prolong human life. So I don't think there's a conclusion from the book to be drawn. I don't know what Winston's views are on, on this, whether it's a, an abomination or she's in favour of it or, or whatever. And it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. One thing I would say is that this book is very funny. Um, in the past, her books, as I say, they're very sort of poetic. And there's some, you know, sort of draw-dropping, astounding metaphors and images that she gives. Here she tells jokes. You know, um, and you know, very funny ones. So they're, you know, the other character uh, who's called Rod Lord, uh, Ron Lord, is a self-made millionaire uh, who is now obsessed with with uh, manufacturing uh, sex robots or sex, you know, automated sex dolls, and his whole world view, view, view is refracted through that. And he's very gauche and and all of that, and not not terribly bright. But he um, he expresses he's he's had a Prince Albert which is a piercing of his penis. And uh, he gets caught in an electrical stall one day and is very scared that he's going to be electrocuted through that, which I've never come across before, but it's a great concept. So, in a, you know, like most uh, Winterson novels, this is not a book with a sort of, you know, clear, linear direction. It's one to sort of just bask and let the ideas and the imagery, such as it is, overtake you. Um, and I'm just going to give some examples of that. You know, this is why I love Jeanette Winterson, because she's so intelligent. Um, 
as, as I say, particularly about love in relationships. I mean, the, the relationship of the two Shelleys is brilliantly done. And of course, the relationship between Stein and Shelley in the modern day is beautiful. You know, they're not even necessarily deeply profoundly in love with, with one another, but they are very driven and attracted to one in, uh, another. Um, so this is, this is Shelley and Stein. Yes, I recall. His lapis eyes that matched his shirt. My sensation of being caught. By what? He took my fingers and kissed them. I love your big hands, he said. If I could choose another body, perhaps I would live in miniature and stand on your hand like one of those magical creatures caught in a nutshell. I can be King Kong, I said. That makes you Fay Ray. Doomed love, he said. That's a programme in need of an overwrite. Love's not zeros and ones, I said. Oh, but it is, said Victor. We are one. The world is naught, naught. N-A-U-G-H-T slash N-O-U-G-H-T. I am alone. You are nothing. One love, an infinity of zeros. I'll stick with the gorilla, I said. Lift me up then and I'll whisper in your ear, quick, before the world bursts in to kill us. I held him close. Whatever he says about the body, his body is what I know. And then another example of just where where um yeah this is the kind of this is a, an example of the ideas that just you know pour through this book he says in the history of the world 107 billion people have lived and died currently there are 76 7.6 billion people alive that means that 93 percent of humans ever born are dead that's so bringing a little sad but so what i say Oh, the current vogue for magical thinking. All those dating sites, pulp romances, sentimental love, the strange idea of the soulmate, Mr. Right, the one. Let's hope there is no such thing as the one, because using numbers, or rather magical thinking, your special one is probably already dead. Cut off from you by time you can't travel. I'm not cut off from you, I say, looking at the bag of body parts. Ah, but where is your heart, Rye? Is it in that bag? You want me to give you my heart? Give it? No, I'd like to take it. I am uneasy. His hand rests on my chest over my heart. You know, so Winston isn't pulling any punches there. This notion of, you know, you have a soulmate out there, it's just a question of will you bump into each other? Well, you know, problem, you know, uh, probability is you won't, be, you know, as expressed there, which is, a, again, a brilliant conception. And that's why these two characters are not in love. They're definitely attracted to each other. I don't think either of them feels that they are there, each other's soulmate. And the, and the bit about um, looking at the bag of body parts, one of, the, one of the great things about this book is that as a doctor, Rye, has become like um, a Burke and Hare to uh, Victor because he's, he's he needs all these sort of body parts to do things like the um, prosthetics and the implants, you know, to test and to research and to experiment into, you know, animating these forms and, you know, if you're going to reproduce how the nerves move and, and operate and all of that. So she becomes his, his I say she, he, she becomes his uh, supplier of body parts, which is a you know a brilliant sort of going back to the 19th century time of Shelley and, and Byron when you know body snatching was was people's greatest fear. Um, and then why again? This is the last example of why I think Winston is so intelligent a writer. This is the best definition of tragedy I've ever come come across. I have written what I have written in no fixed... This is Mary Shelley talking about her early drafts of Frankenstein. I have written what I have written in no fixed chapters yet. Only my impressions. Random, perhaps, but true to the unfolding tragedy of my story. For in tragedy, knowledge comes too late. So I'm just going to read that again as a definition for tragedy. In tragedy, knowledge comes too late. So, you know, things like Shakespeare plays or the Greek plays, you know, all these characters have to die at the end, which is what makes them tragedies, in order to obtain the knowledge that, you know, they don't have at the start of the play or they don't have, the, you know. And, you know, that, that is the, the journey, of course, is a journey of en enlightenment and insight and understanding. Um, but, you know, which I've always felt is a bit artificial because I don't think people go on these journeys. Um, but, you know, tragedy is when the knowledge has come too late. Brilliant. 
So I gave that 4.5 stars. The only reason I didn't give it five stars, as I say, because the, 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 the Shelley uh, Byron stuff, I just, I'd read it before. On to The Lost Children Archive by Valeria Luiselli. And what a beautiful, delicate, intimate, poignant book this is. A blended family in New York of a father and his 10-year-old son and the mother and her five-year-old daughter. They come together, the father and mother marry, and they form this new family unit. And they met, the two parents met, because they're both sound engineers or sound documentarists or archivists, whatever you, you call it, were working together on a project. Um, and they met and fell in love and stuff. That project has come to an end, and now they both want to uh, pursue their own individual projects. He wants to travel to Arizona to record a sort of a soundscape of the landscape of where, you know, the Apache uh, tribe of Indians and Native Americans were finally defeated by the uh, federal government uh, and they were taken into captivity and, and all that sort of stuff. The mother's pet project is she is obsessed with the uh, undocumented children uh, migrants uh, coming from Central America and Mexico. Uh, where there's already a double standard, um, I think this is under the Obama administration, whereby any Mexican citizens were immediately returned, whereas any from the other uh, Central American uh, states had the right to a hearing. And she is sort of obsessed with, with this, and she wants to, again, sort of document it through recordings. Um, although that's a bit sort of abstract in the sense of, what does that mean? And... It sets up one of the key metaphors for the whole book, that both of them are documentarists, archivists, they want to preserve. But what they want to preserve is already been erased, or is in the process of being erased. So the Apaches have been erased in history, and these lost children are being returned. You know, they may get to America, but they're being returned back over the border. Um, and it's this sort of constant struggle between preservation, document documenting versus erasure and the thing is the same applies to their own family um, so they go on this road trip and it's the, the first half or, or three-fifths of the book is from the mother's point of view and she knows that the the, the marriage is doomed because the, the the father wants to stay in Arizona for six months with his son she doesn't want to do that she wants to go and, and do her recordings at the border but she doesn't want to move out there for such a long time. So she, she's just certain that this relationship is doomed and their marriage is going to, is going to break up. Uh, and the tragedy of it is, is the two kids, because they form a really tight bond and they are going to be split up from when the marriage collapses and they are going to be erased from each other's life. So that is, that is the book. It is a road trip. It is from north to south, which, of course, is perpendicular to the, the, the you know, the, the historical uh, road trip and the historical migration, which, of course, was from the East Coast uh, to the West Coast of California and, and all of that. And, of course, there's a, there's a parallel migration coming up from south of the border, moving north to get into America. And she's very, you know, spatially, it's very much sort of against the sort of the historical given of East-West uh, movement. This is north-south and, and south-north. What's so beautiful about the first 205 pages is the mother is interaction with the two children. It's mainly with the son, who of course is not her blood child, but it is with the daughter as well. It is so intimate. It is so tender. It is so intelligent. I've never seen writing of, between a mother and a, you know, of uh, the relationship between a mother and her children as, 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 spot on as this you know this knocks room into a cocked out I know that was a sort of slightly well not slightly I know that was a sort of very artificial environment in which the mother was bringing her child up but when you read this you know I, I don't see how anyone could sort of think room is I mean I didn't think room is a terribly good book anyway but this is just so much more truthful and authentic and profound how she talks to her children how there are tangents of logic because they have different sort of perceptions of the world but they're not conf they're, they don't conflict they don't they don't blow up and cause trouble you know the mother gives the kids space to express themselves 
to allow their imaginations. And that's what's so beautiful about this book. So just to give a couple of examples of that. So they've been playing David Bowie's Space Oddity, sort of on continuous loop in the car. I would say that, you know, one of the references to lost children, they're referring to the migrants, the ones who are shipped back over. But, you know, these, Louis Selly says, what, you know, what do they lose? Even the ones that managed to stay in the States, what have they lost? Well, they've lost their childhoods because they've been brutalised. They've been, you know, shipped from their roots uh, in the same way as the Apache Indians were moved away from their spiritual homelands. They've, you know, they've had to grow up very quickly. They've had to fend for themselves and survive on really dangerous journeys. Um, so there's this concept of, of sort of lost childhood. And if you think about what these two kids are undergoing in the car, you know, they're going on this six week journey and it will be prolonged to six months for the boy across America. They can't play. All they've got, they're sat in the back of the car. They're either talking with the parents where obviously there's an age divide. They're they're asleep. They're listening to music or, um, they're listening to William uh, Golding's Lord of the Flies uh, as an audio book but they, they, they can't really play in the sense of what that's what you normally do in your summer holidays if you're 10 years and under so this is you know where's their childhood for this year you know it's been where's their consent um, you know they've been sort of dragged into this road trip which is an adult concept it's not a, a kid's a kid's concept anyway so they they've been playing sort of a space oddity um, on you know, continuous play. We, this is the mother talking. We play Space Oddity more times than I ever imagined I could listen to a song. When they ask for one more round after the fifth or sixth, I turn back to look at the children scolding me from my seat, ready to tell them that I can no longer take it, can no longer put up with one more replay of the same song. But before I can say anything, I notice that the boy is putting imaginary astronaut helmets on himself and the girl and then lip-syncing into an invisible walkie-talkie. Copy, copy, ground control to Major Tom. I smile at them both, but they don't smile back. They're too focused on holding fast to imaginary steering wheels, ready to be launched in a capsule into space, ejected from the back of the car, maybe, into the wide-open country now stretching out behind and beyond us as we drive deeper into some place. I know that I've begun to drift outward from the nucleus of them, farther away from the centre of gravity that once held my everyday life in orbit. I'm sitting in this tin can, falling away from my daughter and son, and they are my ground control, falling away from me. The three of us being pulled apart by gravity. I'm not quite sure anymore who my husband is in the picture. He is silent, remote, persistent in his task behind the wheel. The sun has set, the light is blue-grey, and he focuses on the road ahead as if underlining a long sentence in a difficult book. So, you know, she's she's been driven mad by, you know, the oral attack of non-stop David Bowie and wants to turn around and scold the, scold the children, and she's disarmed by their imagination because they have taken the song and made it into a game, taken it to sound. This is why I say, you know, the games invented in Emma Donoghue's room cannot hold a candle to, to the the real credible children's imagination portrayed here. I just think the writing of the children is stupendous in here. And another uh, quick example of it. Um, so the, the dad talks a lot about sort of, you know, Native American um, mythology and belief and stuff. And he's talked about how ants are sacred creatures to the Hopi. Which catastrophe are the ants here to take us away from, the boy asked him. I thought it was a good question. Involuntarily poisonous, perhaps. My husband cleared his throat but didn't answer. Then the girl asked, what's a catastrophe? Something very bad, the boy said. She sat silent for a moment, looking at her plate in deep concentration and pressing the back of her fork against her rice to flatten it down. Then looking up at us again, very serious, she delivered a strange agglutination of concepts, as if the spirit of some 19th century German hermeneutist had possessed her. The ants, they come marching in, eat my upper world panties, they take us where there's no, to where there's no catastrophes, just good trophies and touchy freedom. Children's words in some ways are the escape route out of family dramas. 
taking us to their strangely luminous underworld, safe from our middle class catastrophes. From that day on, I think, we started allowing our children's voices to take over our silence. We allowed their imaginations to alchemise all our worry and sadness about the future into some sort of redeeming delirium. Tushy freedom. So, as I say, for me, the first 200 pages of this book are beautiful. Absolutely beautiful, humane, compassionate, poignant, stunning. As I say, the best writing about parent-child relationships I've come across. Uh, it does lose something slightly after that because we then get the perspective of the boy. And that starts by uh, sort of repeating some of the ground covered by the mother, but of course he has a slightly skewed different perspective of it. So they echo one another, they're not reproductions. And without sort of a spoiler, you know, the concept of lost children begins to involve them literally. Um, and that's why, even though I didn't quite buy the boy's point of view so much, it's absolutely vital to the plot. Um, and that's all I can say, really, as I say, without spoiling it. There are lots of other elements to this book. It is a road trip. You know, that's what it is, driving from New York down to the southwest. And what you, what you realise, there's so many descriptions of a band of ghost towns and abandoned buildings, you know, abandoned houses and abandoned factories and abandoned bars and gas stations you know this is a bleak empty you know it's, a, it's an industrial desert uh, that they, they drive through and of course it raises the question of with migrants you know desperately trying to get over, you know there's so much space there you know if they were given the chance maybe they could bring these towns back to life and that those towns historically represented the dreams and hopes of migrants who'd come from the east had come west and southwest and their businesses you know for whatever reason you know, they've abandoned them, you know, in the last hundred years. Uh, and of course, that brings the counter, you know, the sort of the pro-Trump notion of these people are stealing Americans' jobs. Well, no, these areas are abandoned. You know, these people have, have lost their jobs and just left the areas, you know, not because other people have come from south of the border to take these jobs. So it is political, but again, without being instrumental, without spoon feeding you the politics. And, uh, you know, another thing is it is very intertextual. That, you know, I never really get intertextual stuff because I'm not well enough read in, in the classics to pick up the references and the allusions and the direct sort of quotes. Uh, Lewis only lays them out in the back of the book and I read them and then I sort of became a bit more acquainted with them. But, I, you know, that's never a, a deal breaker with me to make me think a book is so wonderful because it's got all this intertextuality stuff or that it's, you know, pretentious and I hate it because it's got... But it's in there. But it's more than that. There's sort of, there's metafiction elements because the parents pack up five boxes of stuff into the back of the car and they have an empty box each for the son and the daughter for them to fill on the journey. That will be their documenting of the journey of this, of this road trip with whatever the kids want to put in there. And the son, uh, they've given, it's his birthday just before they set out from New York and he's given a Polaroid camera. So a lot, you know, he begins to feel the, you know the book the box up with these photos which are reproduced in the back of the book some of them i may have belonged to louis selly some of them are, are sort of public domain purchase rights ones so that's the sort of metafictional element but the, the you know the interesting thing in in the five boxes of the parents is um and this is particularly to elizabeth at bookish north because the book you're currently reading something about the horse and the wheel about sort of the development of language and linguistics is one of the books in one of those boxes and it's you know it's very interesting you know the intertextuality is the book titles are listed you know a lot of them are sort of non-fiction uh, there are a few fiction books there um so that's in there as well and one of the books that's being read is um something that louis selly has made up but drawn on the intertextuality from lots of writers like ezra pound and uh, comrades, Heart of Darkness, people like that. But basically, it's 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 a story that's read throughout the book in the car or in the hotel motels about seven uh, children trying to break for the border and the terrible journey they have on these trains. You know, they they have to sort of clamber onto the onto the roof of the trains and hold on for dear life, and then they have to get off when there's sort of security guards or border police or whatever. Um, and you get sort of fact mingling with fiction or blending with fiction when uh, the, her two kids, the son and the daughter, meet up with with what you've assumed are, 
are the characters from this fictional book, but they, in, in, in here they actually meet up. Um, and it's a really interesting effect to pull off, a sort of fact meets fiction within uh, a work of fiction. And there's just lots of, lots of wonderful stuff like that. And again, without giving a spoiler, you know, the daughter, like the son, has an empty box. The son fills his up with photos of his Polaroid camera. What can the girl fill up? Well, by the, towards the end of the book, she writes down certain things uh, from her trip. And they're through the viewpoint of a five-year-old, so they're not really sort of coherent or logical. But you can recognise them all from, you know, having taken the journey with them. And it is, the, it is the most poignant documentation of the lot because how it is presented to us is the relation, you know, it's, it's you know, the mother knows that she's going to, that this family is going to break up. But the son realised, by the end of the book, the son realises it as well. And he documents the journey for his sister, who's going to be too young to remember it all in the detail he has. But he doesn't want her to forget, so he documents it for you know he helps her write out these impressions for her, leaves it in the in the in the box, gives her the photos, because he doesn't want her to forget him because they're going to be separated, and it it just cuts at your heartstrings that these two beautiful children who are genuinely brother and sister, though they're not blood brother and sister, are going to be pulled apart. They're going to be erased from each other, and you know, so even though I felt some of the brilliance of the first three fists was sort of flagging a bit the ending that pulls it all together is just stunning you know i you know i cannot talk highly enough about this book as i say it's in with a very good chance of being my my book of the month a uh, book of the month a uh, book of the year uh a book's gonna have to go some to beat this um and that's all i can say really it's just uh, an astounding piece of writing so i've had a really good reading week thanks to the two books I read, the Jeanette uh, Winterson and the Valeria Luiselli. Um, I'm going to now put up, I'm not sure which side of me it will be on the side, but this is my uh, bingo scorecard for the Women's Readathon. So I've read seven books. Next week I shall probably read the Yulin Lee, uh, it's non-fiction, it's a sort of memoir about a year of sort of being suicidal how she pulled out of it through her reading and 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 you know talking to other writers or at least corresponding with other writers uh it's not it's not the memoir uh box on the scorecard because that's a memoir by a woman of color this is going to be my um south asian uh box and other than that i'm not sure i'm not sure how long that's going to take me to read um Okay, so uh, that's been my Friday Reads. Uh, huge thanks to the uh, Reading Women Month because it's, it's absolutely made my year so far this week's reading. Till next time.